Next on Garden Line, McCrory Gardens and Brookings. Learn about caring for roses. Especially with hybrid tea roses, is that when those flowers have faded, it's a good idea to remove them. And bronze birch borer control. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Tammy Watson. Tonight on our show, we'll learn about an insect that attacks birch trees and find out how to control it. We will get tips from an extension expert on pruning and fertilizing roses. And in our Garden of the Week feature, we'll take you to McCrory Gardens in Brookings, South Dakota to see ornamental plants near the information shelter entrance. And as always, our panel of lawn and garden experts will answer your questions, so get ready to call in. Our panelists are here with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, weed control, and a host of other lawn and garden concerns. Joining me in the studio are John Keekeffer, Brookings County Extension Educator. Glad to be here tonight. Rhoda Burroughs, Extension Horticulturist. Good evening. Leon Reggae, Retired Extension Weed Specialist. Good to be back. <laughs> Glad to have you. And John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist. And it's good to be back as well. All right. <laughs> Glad you guys are here. We're going to have fun tonight. The phone number for you to call in with your lawn and garden questions is 1-866-595-SDSU. Again, that's 1-866-595-7378. Helping answer the phones tonight are the Brookings County Master Gardeners and Remember, when calling in your questions, please provide our phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your garden problem. Be ready to tell us when the problem first appeared, if any surrounding plants have been impacted, and similar details. Now, before we get to your questions, we have some important information for you. Garden Line went on location with an extension entomologist. We learned how to determine if a birch tree is infested with bronze birch borers and found out how to treat trees infected with this pest. We're here to talk about uh, an important pest of uh, birch trees called the bronze birch borer and we'll examine this tree and see if this tree is infested with uh, again the insects called uh, uh, bronze birch borer. So how, how do you tell whether a tree is infested with a bronze birch borer? Of course a good sign is the insect itself. If you see the insects themselves on the tree then uh, this is how the insect look like. Uh, it's bronze in color that's why it's called the bronze birch borer and also they emerge from the trunk of the tree and produce these uh, holes that look like small letter D. So the outline, is, it, it looks like a D-shaped emergence holes. Uh, again, done, it matches the, the shape of the body of the insect, the bronze birch borer. And also, if you look at the cross section of the tree, you will see uh, a lot of uh, alleyways, if you will. Uh, those are the uh, tunneling that was caused by the larvae are the immatures of the bronze birch borer adults. But it would be nice again if you actually see the insect. There is a new product available to homeowners uh, with the chemical called imidacloprid. It's a systemic product and it can be simply uh, applied to the tree by using a bucket of water. But first you need to measure the circumference of the tree and based on the circumference of the tree uh, that will tell you how, how many ounces of this product you will mix with a bucket uh, of water. So once again the chemical is called uh, imidacloprid which is a systemic product. We we'll go ahead and uh, uh, measure the tree and uh, uh, the tree circumference is uh, 28 inches and, uh, and that's exactly how many ounces uh, we'll mix with a bucket of water here, uh, 28 ounces of, uh, of imidacloprid also. So I have the uh, product uh, measured already, 28 ounces of imidacloprid into one gallon of water here. And then I'm just gonna mix this thoroughly with this twig. And 
and then this mixture will be drenched uh, close to the tree, as close to the tree as possible. It's a very simple way of treating for the insect. So once again, uh, uh, depending on the circumference of the tree, that's how many ounces you'll mix with a bucket, a uh, gallon of, of water. Once the product is applied on the soil, once the soil is drenched, it will take about three weeks for it to be uptake by the tree and the chemical imidacloprid will be translocated in the tree since it's systemic and will begin to kill those uh, larvae that are already in the tree. Okay, now we are almost ready to go to your questions, but first a quick <laughs> round table and some hot topics that uh, our panelists want to talk about. John, what do you have for us? It's crawling and it's live. It's crawling, it's running <laughs> away, so we're gonna see if we can get a couple of them on camera fast and then we'll, we'll run here probably. But we brought in a couple earwigs. Um, these are some, some fairly common insects at this time of year. Um, they're getting into some shady areas. Uh, typically you can recognize them by those, the long tails almost. They're forceps is what they're called. And, and uh, they really can pinch a little bit with them. They typically won't pinch a person too much with them. They really get into shady areas, and so typically when people call in and have some questions about them, what they're dealing with there is that they've got some mulch up close to a house, for example. They have some shade-type plants, and, and those plants just uh, attract those earwigs, and they feed on those plants then. So for control on that, best things to do are to try to clean out some of that, take away their hiding places, and beyond that, if you need to put some sort of insecticide down, you want to look for one with a, a residual effect to it or a systemic action that'll stick around for a little while. Okay, I'm creeping out because they're running free. Are they, if I have these by my house, are they gonna bite me? Are they any problem other than? No, they're really not. They get into houses sometimes, but it's more that they're looking for a shelter. It's not that they're after people. You know, the old story is they crawl into people's ears. Really not likely to be the case. You know, one could accidentally get into an ear, but they're That's not going to try to. They're going to try to seek out plants and other things to eat. Okay, more a problem for like my roses than me. Yep, roses okay. and hostas and especially some shady plants or plants that are planted in shady areas. Okay, thank you. Rhoda, what do you have for us tonight? Well, we're, we're in the full season for strawberries right now, for June-bearing strawberries. And uh, one of the things that we need to do as gardeners with June bearing strawberries is to renovate the beds once they are done bearing for the season. And uh, this is a bed that, that's uh, ready for some renovation. And one of the first things you want to do is look at the leaves and if the tops, of, if the leaves have leaf spots on them, a good thing to do is take a lawnmower and run right over the top. You don't want to get into the crown, but just high enough to, to just get the leaves off, get the old leaves off. That will help remove some of those old leaf spots. So that's what has been done here. He's run through it with the lawnmower. And uh, now he's going to take a rototiller and remake his rows so that we have nice rows that are 12 to 18 inches wide. And uh, this being June, the strawberries will send out new runners. So. Uh, we want to help support that growth by fertilizing at this point. So do your do your fertilizer at this point and uh, you'll be ready for next year. I like the picture with the dog yeah. in it. That looks good. <laughs> okay, Mr. Reggae, what do you got for us? Well, we're coming into the uh, really summertime weeds and uh, when I was thinking about what's really the hot topic, all I had to do was go in the backyard <laughs> because there's a couple of weeds that, uh, and they aren't new, but they certainly are plants that uh, really become, uh, seems like a never ending problem. And I think if we understand about the plants, there's probably why. The first is a purslane, uh, just an incredible thing in a garden. And you, you can be missed two or three days and literally get a wheelbarrow full of this. <laughs> and the trick of that is that you do want to put it in the wheelbarrow because uh, it's, it's succulent and it just seems like if the plants are small, those roots, especially with moisture like we have, they won't quite you know, disconnect. And so you keep getting more, more purslane. But uh, it's just something and, and it's an incredible seed producer. We've had areas in the garden where it just seems to me for three or four years, we've kept it completely clean. Now that sometime back, it evidently wasn't. And so um, we just, that just continually shows up. And I think that's something that gardeners around this with as hot weather comes. And, and you just simply need to 
be very diligent in, in pulling it. I just got to go weed. Huh? And uh, there's not much we can do. What I would suggest, because I noticed that uh, one of our early uh, cucumber plantings is beginning to bloom, and the vine crops are, are going to be starting to, to spread soon. So once it's cleaned up, those crops, I think, always work well. It helps you with some mulching. And we've got some warm weather, and they're growing now, so they've had a chance to take off. So some mulching is going to help reduce how much of the garden that you really have to deal with this thing. It, it's not terribly competitive. One of the things that I recall, if there's a good thing about it, if you have a lot of purslane as a gardener, it's supposed to mean that your soil is really good. <laughs> it responds to phosphorus and it looks like it really takes off. Now, I don't know if that's, you want to starve your garden necessarily, but, uh, but common purslane. Rhoda was mentioning this is one of the plants that you can find recipes for. That's edible. And uh, it is, if you have a lot of patience for a salad. And I, I, I recall one time Garden Line has a history of trying that once. Uh, there wasn't a lot of of request for the recipe, however, so we'll let that go. Uh, the other one that uh, this this time of year, and this is just the perfect conditions for crabgrass. Again, it's not a new new weed, but this is in the garden now. Uh, the last few days with the temperature and moisture, uh, you'll notice crabgrass. Instead of being just kind of a single grassy plant, it, it's really branched. Um, it's just got a whole lot of tillers coming, and it's got this little fibrous root network. Uh, actually, right now, these are pretty well rooted, and uh, one of the tricks when you're weeding is it's very difficult to not just pull this and have it break off, and these will grow back out because you see all these little tillers and buds growing in there, and so you're just going to another week, you're going to have another plant there. Uh, it also, you know, is a common problem in lawns. Uh, it's an annual, and uh, one of the things that why we have crabgrass all the time is I always appreciated the bit of information that I found that said that a single plant can produce 150,000 seeds. So that's why if crabgrass gets away in the lawn one year, eh, you're yeah. going to have crabgrass next year and a few left over for the year after that. Yeah, so. <laughs> but uh, just keep it weeded out in the garden and uh, most of the, uh, you know, if you can keep the lawn active, uh, water so that the lawn takes advantage of it. Uh, it will help compete and there are some herbicide treatments that can be used. Most of the effective ones would have been done earlier in the spring before before it comes up as far as those available to the homeowner. So. Okay, so in a lawn, um, try and At foster the healthy grass point, more so than... Yeah, try to, it, there's, it's gonna be there. You can do some spot treating with some of the materials that, that, that are available for the, for the homeowner. Um, but I think uh, some management things, uh, keeping the grass competitive and then uh, give it a go another year um, is gonna, gonna go a long way. Okay, or make your own yard of the week sign and there stick it do. out there. Yeah. All right, John, what do you got for us? Well, the, the watering, I'll build on his. I'm not sure if watering's a real issue this year. I know last night I was leaving a wake as I was going through our <laughs> pasture. So what I'm talking about is, is water. Uh, flooding, we're seeing quite a bit of. Um, but we're also seeing saturated soils, and a lot of our trees are beginning to dislike that condition. Most of our plants do not like wet feet, and probably one that really doesn't like it is the spruce, particularly blue spruce. And you'll notice that the blue spruce in the center there, the low area, look very blue, not in terms of color, but in terms of condition. Uh, they're declining rather rapidly. And so there's not much you can do about this, frankly, though I did get a call uh, from someone who's actually going to try to put sump pumps out. Uh, which means you've got way too much water. But right now, cherry trees are being affected. They're wilting. Sumacs are wilting. Uh, the blue spruce are turning purple or brown. And that's all due to the flooded conditions. So it's not that you have to have standing water on the site. You just have to have saturated soil conditions. And unfortunately, there's not much you can do about that. But just be aware that you may see damage yet this summer or even this fall related to the wet conditions that are occurring now. Are those trees going to recover? No. No. And, you know, they look so bad, do you really want them to recover? I mean, that's a plant that just is near death and knows it. <laughs> uh, so you're, you're better off uh, giving it up. But, you know, then again, planting blue spruce in a low site to begin with is not wise. And I, and I recognize for a lot of people, they didn't realize they had a low site until this year. But just be aware that's a problem. And, and then the other quick one, just because I'm getting so many calls on it now, is if people have viburnums, little cranberry wish viburnums, 
they'll see what appears to be a fungus. It'll look felt-like on the tips of the leaves, and they'll, they'll call me up and say, well, I, what fungicide do I spray? None. This is actually a little mite uh, that does it, a little uretified mite, and it causes this kind of blistering and felt-like growth on the tops of the plants. And frankly, there's nothing you can do. It's the damage is already done. It's like most things, we see it too late. And even if you knew it was coming this spring, I probably wouldn't recommend control. Uh, the reason people are seeing it this year, again, is due to those wet, cool conditions, like we're seeing lots of problems. So at this point, people notice it, cut off the leaves, so, and, and not worry about it. So just prune off the infected stuff? and The infested stuff. Infected. It's not infected. Oh. It's, it's the little mite in that, in that little felt. Oh, okay. And that. So just cut it away, and it's gone. All right. Thanks. Well, on we go. Earlier, Garden Line paid a visit to McCrory Gardens in Brookings, South Dakota to soak in the floral beauty. Our camera looked closely at the ornamental plants near the information shelter entra entrance to the gardens, and here's a snapshot of that welcoming outdoor decor. Those are some wonderful images, and hopefully our gardens are going to look as good as McCrory Gardens with your advice. So let's dive in. A uh, question from Pierre. Why are the carrots in my garden bitter? Is it the variety I planted? Is it something in the soil or lack of something in the soil? There's actually been quite a few studies on bitterness in carrots because it is a common problem. and uh, it. it Certain varieties tend to have it worse, and, and it does tend to concentrate, some of the bitterness will concentrate in the peel, so you may be better off if you give it a good peeling. But uh, basically, any kind of stress in carrots can cause this bitterness. So if it, if it was too wet, it was too dry, it was too hot, too cold, basically. Oh boy. Any of those, it makes you kind of wonder that you ever get good carrots. But <laughs> But so there's not really any one thing that can cause that. But I would try some different varieties. The uh, purple haze carrot has more sugars in it, and that may help overcome any bitter, bitter taste. So that might be one you want to try. Okay. We had a <coughs> caller with a comment from Mo. Uh, yeah, Leon. Norm and Mary Kay in Mobridge are eating purslane right now. Hey, so, great. <laughs> just, I'm wondering if they're had the patience to really make the whole salad out of purslane. You can mix it with other greens, 
put in a little bit of boiled egg. I think it depends how much patience you have to uh, get how much of the purslane, but it can be enjoyed. Very it, nutritious. It, yeah, I was going to ask any comments on the nutritional value going on there? I, I don't recall the, but the, uh, it, it's really, there's a number of vitamins that it's, it's really strong. It'll have just a little bit of tartness, uh, almost like we were mentioning here when you bite into oxalis or an orange rind. There's a, uh, just a little bit of that oxalic acid kind of a taste to it. So it has a, Very high has a neat. Very high in omega-3s fatty acids. That's Seriously? A, yeah. Hey, that's good to know. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I don't think this... It'll make my purslane look entirely different. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather eat cardboard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's face it, people, nobody's... Uh, we got two people out there eating it. That's it. <laughs> okay, well, nobody's eating this. We're moving on to a question. Uh, we actually have a picture of this. I don't think anybody would be eating this. What kind of moth will this caterpillar turn into? It couldn't possibly any, be any more lovely than this caterpillar. And... Uh, it's a question from Chamberlain, and uh, I think the picture actually came from St. Cloud, Minnesota, though. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure that has a lot of omega-3. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so let's have it. But, uh, but yeah, that's the, uh, it's one of the white-marked, though they can be a little yellow sometimes, white-marked tuffet moth. And the, uh, that's the, uh, the uh, caterpillar stage, of course. And they'll feed on a variety of woody plants, birches, lindens, and such. And they look kind of cute until they start devouring your tree. Uh, they tend to run in cycles, but if they just saw a few, and frankly, that's all I've seen this year. I haven't seen that many, so it's not an up year. But yeah, they're kind of pretty. A lot of those hairs, that's designed to, uh, to make them not very palatable. Uh, if you try to eat that, it's going to be like uh, licking your cat, you know, you're going to get quite a hairball in there. So uh, things tend to avoid it, but it uh, sounds a lot like personally. <laughs> but yeah, it is kind of, a, kind of a pretty little moth. You can pet it, it's not going to hurt you, but okay. don't worry about it. Okay. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. Um, okay, question from Rapid City, and uh, uh, here we go. Before being rototilled this spring, uh, they had two Two inches of compost from the Rapid City landfill was spread over this caller's garden, which it show, the garden had shown healthy growth last year. The tomato, corn, and lettuce on one side, about a tenth of the total garden, has had normal healthy growth. The remainder turned a sickly yellow color and is badly stunted. The sick tomato plants were replaced with new ones in new holes. Those have also turned yellow, failed to grow. Uh, what could be the cause if it's due to the compost? Are they going to have the same problem next year? Thoughts, comments? Well, I actually contacted these people and, and, and learned a little bit more about it. And uh, um, one of the things I wanted to know is whether the growth was distorted at all or if it was mm -hmm. just stunted. Mm -hmm. And they said no, no distortion, just stunting. And I'm wondering if this particular round of compost may not quite have been finished so that it's still using a lot of nitrogen. The bacteria in the compost are using up the nitrogen and taking it away from the plants. And that could explain both the yellowing and the stunting. So one thing I'd suggest is go ahead and, and add some nitrogen um, and see if that helps the plants. It, it may be a case where they won't be able to use their garden till later later this summer but uh, that's that would be my first guess if they're still having problems later in the summer uh, contact us and, and we'll look at it a little more carefully again okay any other comments no I think that's that's it that is one that's problem with best, compost it's that's the best uh, that given given yeah. the information here that, and with all the moisture and so forth where mm -hmm. the nitrogen is getting kind of pushed anyway and on top of it if uh, this is tying up some more of it that's uh, that that can be an issue with some well, of the composting. And you're, and you're right on that I've, I've been yes. noticing today even some small trees that were yellowing it's the yeah. fact the soils are so saturated you're not even getting nitrogen uptake so that could even be compounding their problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay all right I think this next question is coming to you John a uh, caller from Mitchell would you please give instructions on how to treat your clothing with permethrin for mosquito control? Now, we've, Garden Line has covered that before, but let's go through it again. Right. Yeah, it's kind of an important topic, especially this time of year. It's one of those, you know, two weeks ago, we weren't seeing very many mosquitoes, and now you step outside and you get covered with them. So I think it's a really kind of a timely one. The West Nile carriers, the uh, 
the Culex mosquitoes are increasing in numbers now, and so it's a good idea to, to try to protect yourself a little bit too. If you haven't done that, if you have some questions about whether or not you might have West Nile, um, we've got symptoms listed here. You know, the classic symptom that starts, of course, is going to be that headache. You're going to get an unusual or a severe headache. It's usually going to persist for several days. Uh, the sooner you can get in and see medical professionals on it, the better off you're going to be on that one. The others uh, may or may not be there. Don't think that you have to have all of these symptoms to have West Nile. You could have just a few of them. You know, some of them I guess that I think are more common, the stiff neck as the lymph nodes start to swell. That mild rash, especially across the chest, is pretty common in these. Um, and it's one of those, like I say, if you suspect you have it, get in there and see your doctor right away. To try to protect yourself, those repellents are really going to be the most important thing. And the ones listed here, of course, are DEET, picaridin, and oil of lemon eucalyptus. Uh, DEET is going to be our most common one around here. Permethrin is another one that gets used for some things like that. And permethrin is a little bit different because some of these others can be used on skin. Permethrin should not be used on skin. It's a, a repellent that is applied to clothing. And the way that you're going to want to apply that is put it on the clothing, preferably before you're wearing that clothing. Let it you know, sit on that clothing for a little bit before you wear it. And then even after you're done, when you get to washing that, wash that clothing separately. It'll often persist through at least one washing, sometimes through several washings, um, continue to be effective during that time. But there is some toxicity there. It's not something that you really want on your skin. It's not something that you want to be in long-standing contact with. And it's something you do, really don't want to get on infants or very small children, if you can help it. Okay, so if I had a long sleeve, say, you know, a garden shirt, um, treat that, wear that when I go out to the garden in the evening, hang it off, hang it up when I come back in after 45 minutes and Right, and use, use that it again. Clothing. Right. Okay. Yep. Use that or use even like a gardening type hat, something like that that can help keep them away. And then the other one is, of course, just avoid time of day. Um, we've got a website up here as well that provides a lot of information on where West Nile is found. Um, yeah, when it's been found in the state, how to deal with it, how to deal with other mosquito problems if you've got mosquitoes breeding in your yard by chance. But you know, just even avoiding that time of day, making sure that you're not out at dusk and somewhat at dawn, more at dusk, but uh, when those mosquitoes would be biting most actively, good idea to avoid those times, stay inside during that and, and just try to keep yourself safe from West Nile and any of the other encephalitis as well. Okay. I have a question for you. Sometimes we gardeners get a little creative with like, oh, I'll catch rainwater. And how long, if that's sitting around, is, I mean, is that a bad idea, period, with mosquitoes? Or can I use it within the, I mean? They will start to breed in there fairly quickly. And I think that's kind of important, too. We covered a couple of weeks ago on Garden Line, showed a segment with uh, putting mosquito dunks into mm -hmm. some of those standing water areas. The same will work for, for those rain barrels or other catch basins for rainwater those uh, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis tablets that you've just soak in there. Otherwise, uh, you know, look even at a conventional type insecticide larvicide to try to control those mosquito larvae in those standing water areas. Okay, that's great. We can go to the Garden Line website and watch that and catch up with that if you missed it the first time. Okay, a question from Huron. The Huron Gray Dogwood. Um, they've heard John Ball mention it more than once, but they can't find it. Where is the Huron Gray Dogwood tree available shrub? What What is it? Well, it's, uh, and, and I, I mentioned it one time, but I probably twice during the show. And it's a nice shrub, so it's, it's worth talking about again. It's a gray dogwood, and gray dogwoods typically get rather tall, but this one gets about six feet, five feet. So it's a, it's a smaller dogwood. Tolerates a lot of conditions, but it's a bird haven. The, the birds just love it for the fruit and it's a pretty plant during the fall. I checked, the wholesalers carry it. And so what are they, where are they calling from? Um, this, they are calling from Huron. Okay. You know, it would seem to me, uh, they have some excellent garden centers in Huron. And I'm sure if they were to go in there and ask, uh, if they're not carrying it right now, the wholesalers that they buy from uh, have it. So they could probably obtain it for them. So, and I always recommend it. Go to your local garden center and just ask the question, could you order it for me? Because sometimes they're not going to carry something if it's not very well known yet. Uh, but their suppliers will have it for them. So I'd go back and ask. Okay, great. Uh, question from Aurora. 
Blossom Set Spray. Is this worth buying or is it a gimme? Is that, uh, would you spend money on Blossom Set Spray? I'm assuming they mean for tomatoes and, and yeah. primarily. Um, what Blossom Set Spray does is fool the plant into thinking there is actually a pollinated seed in and so it goes ahead and forms fruit. It will work for tomatoes, but you get kind of funky tomatoes because they don't have the seed, so they don't have the gel around the seed. So you can get fruit, but it it's, may not be quite the fruit that you were hoping for. That sounds kind of like I wouldn't mess with it. I don't know. If that's <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you're using it for salsa or something. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Oh, point taken. Another tomato question, this one from Rapid City. They've been watering tomatoes with rainwater and want to know what water source is safe to use if the rainwater is not available. Is city water a good idea? Sure. <laughs> People sometimes worry about the chlorine in, in city water supplies, but I've never seen any damage from it in, in any of our fruiting vegetables or, or even lettuce or anything like that. Okay. Um, John, coming back to you, caller from Elkton, maybe they missed the beginning of the show, maybe they just want to know more. You talked about earwigs, they say they've been invaded with earwigs and they need to know how to treat. Yeah, that's, uh, that's been kind of the, the hot topic of the week. That's kind of why we brought it up a little bit earlier here. Um, as far as treating for earwigs, again, first things that you're going to want to do are look for those hiding places. Try to eliminate any and all hiding places. If they've got some place where they can crawl into something, under something, and kind of hide during the day, those are going to be the places where you're going to tend to find them. So if you can avoid having some of those around, you can get rid of a lot of your earwigs just simply by getting rid of hiding places. Then as far as treating, we end up dealing with a couple sorts of things here. We get people who call in and ask about them on garden plants, and we get people who say they're getting into the house. And what I typically recommend for people is if they're on the garden plants, you're going to want to treat them very much like you would for grasshoppers. They're fairly active, mobile insects. They were running around in here pretty quickly, and they'll do the same thing out in the garden. So it's not something that's going to sit there on the plant and have a chance to really have an insecticide work on it. Contact insecticides don't work very well because typically we're not spraying when they're active. They're out at night, and we're not out spraying them. So you want to look at something with some residual effect or something that's going to be systemic and stay in the plant for a little while. For trying to deal with them in the house, if they are getting in, try to seal up those openings where they could be crawling in, under doors, around windows, things like that. And then beyond that, you may need to put a barrier spray down. Uh, one of the standard insecticides that can be sprayed around foundations. It can help slow them down a little bit. Again, because they're so active, they may cross it and end up dying inside the house. Um, but, you know, you can sweep them up alive or dead, I guess. And, <laughs> Stomp on them if they're still running around. Okay, thanks, John. Um, up next, we're going to touch on the topic of proper care for roses. Here's extension horticulturist David Graper at the McCrory Gardens Rose Beds with pruning and fertilizing tips. Hi, I'm Dave Graper, director of McCrory Gardens, and tonight we're going to talk a little bit about taking care of roses in your garden. A lot of people really enjoy growing roses. It's one of the most popular you know, garden plants that people have in their gardens. And there are many different types of roses out there. And right now, we're seeing kind of roses at their peak, uh, especially some of the shrub rose varieties that we have out there, like the one that we have here, which is called John Cabot, which is actually kind of a shrub climbing rose. Uh, unfortunately, we had some heavy rain last night, so some, we lost some of the color that it had. But it's been really a very beautiful rose uh, for the last uh, two weeks or so. And we still have more flowers showing up on the plant, so it's not quite done blooming yet. But we're getting to the point now where we got uh, a lot of heat and humidity, a lot of rain and so forth. That's the time that we're going to take a look at your roses and see how they're doing. One that you want to always check for are disease issues, see if you're seeing a lot of spotting and so forth showing up on the leaves. That may mean that you're going to need to use some fungicide treatments to try to help protect those roses from uh, future disease problems. Another thing we think about oftentimes, especially with hybrid tea roses, is that when those flowers have faded, it's a good idea to remove them to give room for new flowers to come forth. On a shrub rose, we don't worry about that too much because we also can enjoy uh, some of the rose hips that will develop later on the, on the old stems, and those can give us some color in late summer and even into the winter months. But on a typical hybrid tea, we're going to cut down to a nice big five leaflet leaf or one that has even seven leaflets on it, and that's going to encourage those lower buds to break, form a new shoot, and give us additional flowers later on in the, in the summer. 
Another thing we always want to watch for are just dead growth in there, especially in the spring. It's a good idea to go through your roses, cut back any of the shoots that might have been damaged over the winter months, get those pruned out down near the base. And in the case of a shrub rose, sometimes it gets so large that it's a good idea to do a little renewal pruning as well. Just take out some of those biggest, oldest shoots down near close to the bottom. If you do that before midsummer, that's going to encourage some new shoots to develop up from the base. So that will give you a bigger, uh, fuller rose down near the bottom, lots more flowers probably for that upcoming season. And that's going to give a good way to keep those roses the size you want them and keep them from getting too rangy and gangly and not have to worry about getting a thorny rose bush slapping you in the face as you walk through the garden. Other than that, a little fertilizer is also good. Uh, try to fertilize them early in the season. Avoid fertilizing later on in the year. You can use any of the rose type fertilizers that are out there or just a general 10-10-10 rose fertilizer or just everyday all-purpose fertilizer would also work quite well. Just scatter maybe about a half a cup around the base of the plant, scratch it into the ground a little bit, give it a good watering, and that should keep your roses going for the rest of the summer. All right, we're going back to some emailed questions, and we've got a question that was sent in, um, I think, about a week ago. It's a good picture, picture. Something is chewing on our asparagus, especially near the tips. Is it the insect in the photo? If so, what can we do about them? And this is from White, South Dakota. Yep, they nailed it. This is the one. This is the insect in the photo. Is chewing on the, on the plant as well. This is a, an asparagus beetle. It's in the same family as the Colorado potato beetle and the bean leaf beetles and a number of other plant feeding beetles. Um, they will cause some, some defoliation of the asparagus. Typically, I think we're going to see less problem with them uh, than maybe some of the others. You know, the asparagus can withstand some defoliation and, and not have real great problems with it. But uh, if you're seeing larger numbers on those plants, probably a good idea to put some insecticide on them or if you just have a few plants go ahead and hand pick them if you can. I'd use gloves. And just, They're is, crunchy. They, is, they would, is that, can I just pinch them off and yeah, smush exactly. them? Yep, All right. Just smush them. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another question that, ha that was emailed in in advance and they have a photo here um, from Harrisburg. We live in Harrisburg and have a three-year-old Japanese lilac tree planted in full sun in our front yard. Every year when it buds out, the leaves start to curl and it does not produce the nice white plumed blossoms that it's supposed to. I'm sending a picture of how the tree is supposed to look this time of year. The other plants in the same area do well. What could be the cause for a Japanese lilac not uh, producing? Well, actually we're seeing a lot of problems with Japanese tree lilacs this year. Uh, and what it is is a bacterial blight. Uh, symptoms usually look like fire blight, but it's on a tree lilac and that'll be blackening leaves, water-soaked leaves, and the tips are often curled as well. And it is a bacteria. Uh, the only way you can really manage it is prune off the infected tissue further than where you see the infection. Uh, spray the pruners with Lysol disinfectant so you're not spreading it. Uh, spray a copper fungicide before bud break, and that's about it. We really don't have any sprays for bacteria. And I've seen plants recover. We've had some tree lilacs on campus here that have had the inf been infected, and I pruned out the infection spray, and most of them have come back. So more than likely, when they show that picture, that's the way they're supposed to look like. But the way hers probably looks like is the blackened tips curling, almost like a shepherd's crook, and that would be the bacterial blight. That's the most likely cause, but there could be others. Okay, thanks, uh, Leon. I've been—I don't know if this is a weed question or not, but I was looking for one for you. Um, caller from Selby. There's a circle in the lawn, six inches across. It's brown. What could it be? How can it be cleared off? Cleared well, off. Well, <laughs> prop circles. <laughs> would be, yeah, yeah. Lawn be related to weeds if somebody had tried, <laughs> tried to control the weed that was there. And uh, I don't know just uh, from a weed standpoint what that would be. That it's uh, Something affecting the grass, I mean something, I don't know if it's in an area that could have been spilled, uh, is it a you know, salt type thing, uh, Problem dog is, yeah, cat yeah, thing, I mean we don't know. A lot of 
dead things. I've seen it in some lawns where the lawnmower is leaking just a little gas, yeah. and every time it drops, it kills the spot. It could be some insects. You might want to try pulling some of that grass up, the dead grass, and, and see if you get some little white grubs under there. If they're the large C-shaped ones, you could have white grubs in there. You could have billbug larvae under there as well, but it could be any number of things. Is, is it just a right. spot? Is it, if it's just one spot, then, you know, yeah. it seems like something, something affected that spot. It. You know, we, we've got a couple leaf diseases, but they're usually what you'll have is that bright green ring around it, and then it'll be yeah. dead. But you'll have patches throughout the yard, just like right. the uh, grubs. Yeah. I know one way to produce a spot like that, yeah. and that's to have a little bit of drip out of the nozzle if you're doing some edging with the Roundup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you forget to, about the drip, or uh, that, that, that'll that make a spot pretty, yeah. pretty effectively. Okay. Um, another question with a photo here uh, qu from Arlington. John, this blue spruce and others, summer black hill spruce, uh, in the back, the ones in the background are about 18 inches tall in 2003 when they were planted. About midsummer last year, all the trees were five feet tall when this one in front started to lean in a contorted way. After that, it kind of balled up, doing the same this year. It's now less than three feet tall. It does not appear to be dying off or losing needles. It's just contorted and misshapen. Um, seriously, it used to be about a foot and a half taller. Uh, I've seen plants get twisted up like this after being sprayed, but it has no needles dying and the color still looks okay. What do you yeah. think? Well, the tips do look pretty nice on there, but I, that's on its way out. And, and spruce will do that. Spruce are like sheep just looking for a place to die. They look, <laughs> no, I'm serious. They'll look nice one day, you go out the next day and they're dead. Sheep do that. Um, and with blue spruce, one of the biggest things is trying to reduce grass competition. You notice that grass is right up to them, and the cleaner you keep it around it, the better, because they don't do well with competition. I can't tell if that was in a slightly lower area, but I mean, they are so sensitive to moisture that that could be it. At that size, we don't have too many insects that bores that would attack a tree that young that would cause the tip to die back. So I think really what you're looking at is environmental problems. And that tree is probably not going to come back. They'd be better off just finishing it off and checking the site and planting something else. And I'd go with the black hill spruce before blue spruce. Just okay. like that. Why, why is that? Why do you prefer black hills over blue spruce? Hello, we're in South Dakota, our state tree. I mean, <laughs> but, but the other thing, too, is it is if you're going to plant a spruce, it's a little bit more tolerant of, of conditions than blue spruce. We're kind of pushing the boundaries on all these blue spruce that we have. Well, in town, they can be some beautiful specimens, but sometimes, yeah, we're pushing the envelope. Okay. Leon, you're nodding. Yeah, I, I agree. We've got some around our, our planting, and, and there's, they're a lot more sensitive on site things, and, yeah. and, uh, but they can be very beautiful. Oh, yeah, that's if, what if, if, And you can do that in town okay. uh, and places. A uh, question from Winter about peaches. Uh, seriously, peaches in South Dakota. They're developing but then falling off the tree. What could be causing it? Thoughts? Comments? Um, one thing that I've seen this year is peaches took some winter damage to the wood and uh, sometimes they'll go ahead and bud out and start to form fruit and then the winter damage catches up with them. So that, that might be one possibility. Another possibility is they're flooding again if they're in a wet area uh, that may be catching up with them as well. I've seen that on cherry. They're very, I mean, you know, prunus, and that's what these plants are, genus prunus, are very sensitive to even saturated soil conditions. So you're right, Rhoda. It just could be the, you know, they might say, well, it's not wet there. Well, it's still saturated, and that, that's, that's uh, caused a lot of problems with these plants. Okay. Another question that was emailed in with some good photos here uh, from Gerritsen. Looking to identify this creeping flower, I got it from an elderly woman in Sioux Falls. She told me they were captain's buttons. However, I have not been able to find any information on that name when searching for it. What is this? I actually searched on captain's buttons, too, and nothing came up. But uh, <laughs> then I went to my perennials book, and this is Creeping uh, Buttercup. And if you look real carefully, I don't know if you can see it on the, on the TV monitor or not, but they're actually, a, there we go a shininess to the to the petals and that's characteristic of anything in the buttercups. These like it moist, so this year they should be real happy. <laughs> should be, <there> <laughs> um, the the 
this is a double flowered version that's in that's a named uh, cultivar, which I forget the cultivar name right now, but. But uh, the single form is actually quite invasive and is a real problem weed in the Pacific Northwest. So if you have this, I would be kind of keeping an eye on it. Most years, it's probably dry enough. We're not going to have a problem with it. But, but this year, it might get away from us. <laughs> OK, question from Clear Lake. They have trouble with a woodchuck eating cabbage and kohlrabi in the garden. What can the caller use to bait a live trap that won't attract the cats? <laughs> They're, they're thinking ahead. They're doing this right. I would try exactly what it's what eating in the garden. Cabbage if and that's rabbit. what it's going for. It's You're not going to get many cats. <laughs> 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 Put a little first leg in there. <laughs> sure. Yeah, but catch the neighbor. Yeah, catch the neighbor. <laughs> All right. But you're right. Yeah, put in what they're eating. Don't they? That's pretty obvious yeah. there. Good, good catch. Um, question for John Ball again from Desmet. De uh, caller has an elm tree. Should they cut it down or prune? They're wondering if they have Dutch elm. The leaves are all dying. The tree is 40 to 50 years old. It's basically got no leaves at all. Well, you're not pruning it at that point, and, and we are seeing a lot of Dutch elm disease. It's showing up earlier this year. For example, the city of Brookings is already going out and marking, and we've already taken down one infected tree. I'd like to point out that the year we see the infection doesn't mean it was necessarily infected that year. It's probably been infected for several years and now showing symptoms. But if we're getting flagging wilted leaves right now, uh, most likely it is due to Dutch elm disease at this time of year. Um, most cities are, are beginning to mark. If there's no leaves left on it already, I would just say take the tree down. But since it may have had Dutch elm disease, you've got to debark the wood or burn the wood or otherwise destroy the wood. If you just cut the tree down and stack the wood, uh, the beetles will come out of that and carry the disease to other elms. Okay. A uh, question from Madison. They have valiant grapes. The mature grapes turned brown before ripening. What would this be? Uh, there's a couple different fungal diseases that can do this. Um, and, and black rot is, is one of them. Uh, if it's a soft rot, uh, it might be an anthracnose, um, um, might be botrytis. Um, but, but with Valiant, it's a very vigorous grower. One of the ways to help decrease this kind of disease is to prune it really hard in the, in the winter. You want to leave maybe 40 or 50 buds on the whole vine when you get done pruning. So you're taking off 80 to 90 percent of the, of the wood of the vine and <clears throat> that will usually help quite a bit. There are fungicides that you can use then early in the spring right at bud break and, and every 10 to 14 days after. So those are some possibilities. If you want to uh, send a sample we can find out for sure exactly which fungus it is and, and give you a little bit more targeted uh, information. Okay, uh, a question from Platt. Uh, actually, a two-part question. First, about asparagus. When do I cut down the spent asparagus plant? How long do they need to leave the tall, ferny? October. Stuff? Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't be cutting them down <laughs> you, soon. You don't want to cut them down until they've turned yellow off from yeah. frost. So that's the plants growing and uh, getting mm -hmm. energy and doing some constructive I stuff there. just leave it till real early in the spring, and yeah. it kind of protects and catches yeah, some snow catch. and so forth mm -hmm. yeah. there. Okay. Um, potato, something's cutting off the stems on my potato plants. What could it be? And again, that's from Platt. Oh boy. Uh, well, we think insects if we'll pick it on you. Yeah, probably. Uh, Colorado potato beetle in some cases can, can get so prevalent that they'll start pruning stems. I guess I'm. I'm wondering about some little mammal. Yeah. The potatoes should be big enough at this point. That and they'd be resistant be. To, to a lot of the insect type of, of uh, stem cutters. But yeah, I'd be curious to know if they're actually finding the stems cut and laying there, or if it's a case that they're just gone. What would the difference tell you? Well, if I guess from what I've seen a lot of times, if the stems are laying there, just cut and laying there, it almost certainly is a little mammal that came along and took a taste and didn't like it much. <laughs> I mean, potatoes really aren't very palatable to a lot of mammals. The leaves aren't, that is, and um, you know, a lot of them will take a taste and just drop it. If the leaves are truly gone, then I might be more suspicious of some of the insects. Okay. 
All right, moving on, a question from Rapid City about beets in the garden. The underside of their beet leaves, something's chewing off the bottom layers. It's just beginning to show up now. Uh, they wonder if it's slugs, but they're not seeing any of them. Uh, what might they be able to use to treat the leaves? Well, that's, slugs would be a, a fair guess on that one, I think. Um, you know, we've got a couple products out there. There are some of those home remedies, and people have varying su success with those things. Um, there are a couple products out there that are, are sold for garden use. Um, one is an iron phosphate. It's Sluggo is the, the brand name on it. The other one is a metaldehyde product that I, I guess I hadn't realized until earlier this year is available in garden formulations now and, and can be found in some shelves. Okay. Uh, uh, slugs could certainly be it, but are there any leaf miners that, that affect that or, or skeletonizers? You know, I, don't, I don't know, but I was just curious. There certainly could be. The fact that it's on those lower leaves makes me suspect it's probably a yeah. slug. Could be earwigs even, you know, we talked about yeah. earwigs earlier. But if they if they put a little trap, you know, like the, the beer or something, the beer, stale the beer, at least if they're catching slugs, then they would know, aha, the problem is slugs before they went to treat for slugs, right. just in case it was something else. Yeah, mm -hmm. it so. certainly could be earwigs or, yeah. or skeletonizers or something else in there as well. I got a real quick question I got to throw out. You, you mentioned Colorado potato beetle. Does South Dakota, like, do we have like any n insects named South Dakota <laughs> in it? Is, is well, it that poor of a question? Everybody's laughing. I, do we want to? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not like that. Huh? Okay. I, not that I know of. We have, Good there are some with then. Dakota in them. There's, oh, yeah. for example, Dakota skipper is a little yeah. butterfly that uh, Kind of gets a lot of attention. Yeah, it's actually on threatened species list and yeah. okay. gets a lot of attention. There are some others that have Dakota in them. I don't know that we have any South Dakota ones. And to the extent and discussion that the Colorado potato beetle gets out at the community gardens here in Brookings, <laughs> I would think if Colorado got to vote on it again, they would probably opt out. <laughs> <laughs> they might give it to Dakota. Those are just, you know? <laughs> it's incredible there. Well, you know, but there's there's a good question for next week. I'm going to look and find out what what threatened that. disease or insect or that that we have out there is named Dakota or South Dakota. You know, you yeah. know, something to talk about. See if something's out. named Tammy out okay. there. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, and uh, if you can email that to me, I'll do that with a picture for next week. <laughs> Moving on, <laughs> not fast enough. Question for Rapid City. Grass clippings, fresh gra grass clippings on the garden. Do I need to add nitrogen? So if they're putting fresh, gra fresh grass clippings. You know, to me, the and, and Rotary folks can jump in this too, but uh, one of the researchers that I worked with on a different project, but he worked on this nitrogen problem. And he said the, the real problem is when you incorporate this in. Mm -hmm that you get the nitrogen decrease because you've got to get the, the materials mixed into the soil. If the grass clippings are merely laying on top of the soil, you don't get that, that nitrogen reduction. But to me, grass clippings mat so, so much. I'm not sure if I would use fresh grass clippings, but does it matter on a, on a garden? I think you can usually get away with it, but okay. uh, uh, I, go ahead, I think Leon. you want to uh, avoid really deep layering it because they are so wet and with the temperatures that we have now I've seen actually where they really become heated in there and I've seen some like tomato leaves will tend to curl up and I'm not sure there isn't some other thing evolves out of that that affects leaves for a little while and will cause some distortion but I think if they're layered uh, you know relatively light and then let those kind of dry down and put on another layer they I wouldn't is it, but is we the, use it. But the key is not to mix them into the soil because that's when you're going to get the nitrogen depression. Um, come fall, do I need to get those out of there or can I till them under at well, that point? Then they, they're yeah. fine at that then point. They're fine. Yeah. Okay, but under. just not yeah. the green, fresh ones. Right. Yep. Okay, I'm learning. I'm learning as we go. Don't come and see my garden, guys. Sioux Falls, uh, all roses have gray looking leaf and dead heads that, that are staying on the stem. Um, it does have blossoms, but all the leaves are bad. They're slowly, this has been slowly developing for the last two to three weeks and affecting the whole plant. The rose bushes out of Sioux Falls. <coughs> I'm trying to think of some leaf diseases that might be, but. Would there be any powdery mildew? The mildew. Oh, we're seeing sure. lots of mildew. Uh, and these are ideal conditions for 
any kind of mildew. You, you were talking about grapes. Mm -hmm. That can be a real problem if that isn't opened up and have some air movement. It'll and, just and lilacs take off. Too. Lilac, a lot we'll of white now. grain yeah. lilacs mm -hmm. because of the mildew problem too. So it may be what they're I would at. think that'd be a start without. Okay, um, I think we're just about at the time to wrap up. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for this evening. Now, just to let you know, Garden Line repeats twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting's Digital Channel 3, which is also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central, Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your local listings to find SDPB Digital Channel 3 where you live. Now, thanks to our panel of experts, John Kiekeffer, Brookings County Extension Educator, Rhoda Burroughs, Extension Horticulturist, Leon Reggae, Retired Extension Weed Specialist, and John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist. Thanks to our phone volunteers, the Brookings County Master Gardeners, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. Have a good evening. Please be sure to tune in next week. And if you can't wait until the repeat times, go online to our website, watch the show there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, have a good evening. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications.